Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Yo Samdi Sam for a new season of autism and neurodiversity content. Um, I'm your host, Sam, and today we will be joined by the brilliant Paul from Asperger's from the Inside. He has a YouTube channel that he's had for many years, and it's really excellent. I'm sure a lot of you follow him already. Um, Paul is also the founder of the Autism Explained uh, organization, which is running a free summit in September that I have been one of, I am one of the speakers of. So um, the link to that is in the description box below if you'd like to go check that out. But Paul will tell you a little bit more about that. So let's just uh, welcome Paul to the stream. Hi, Hi how are man. you over there in Australia? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, it's the end of a long week here. So I'm doing all right. Good, good. So can you tell us, uh, for those who, of my viewers who don't already know you, a little bit more about yourself and your YouTube channel and the summit that's coming up? Uh, yep. So basically, I found out I was on the spectrum um, at the age of 30 a couple of years ago. I started a YouTube channel um, called Asperger's from the Inside because when I delved into all of the, you know, autism um, textbooks and I was reading books on Asperger's and things like that and I, I found that I just didn't like how they were portraying things. I found that it, it makes sense of describing things from the outside but I thought there was something significantly missing in the, the literature that I was reading which was you know what's the experience on the inside. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to sort of share that with the world. Um, and then recently I started Autism Explained, which is has more of a focus on um, helping parents and teachers understand autistic children. Um, and the idea with that is that, you know, parents are the most influential people, right, in a, in a child's life. So if we can empower parents, like everywhere in the world to, understand autism, understand their children, then they can create the, the kind of supportive environments where we actually can do really well if we're supported to do really well. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the, the adults that I, that I, that I speak to, um, sort of like myself and, and older, we just didn't have any of those supports when we were younger um, with, with mixed results, right? Yeah. Some, some of us were kind of lucky and did all right, and some of us really paid a really heavy price for um, misunderstandings. Um, so hopefully we can educate the world a little bit. Um, and I'm really excited that there are so many other autistic voices that are, are popping up and sharing their own perspective, uh, like like your channel, for example. Um, yeah, well, it seems like the last uh, year or so, or like the last couple of years, there's been a big shift, actually. There's been a lot of uh, new autism channels from autistic people and like just more media, more books and stuff, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. It's a, like a new movement. So I'm kind of excited to be a part of that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about this uh, summit? It's it's part of the Autism Explained uh, organization, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, we, we ran the first one last year, which was a, which was a huge success. Um, and basically the, the format is I have interviewed 25 autism experts from all over the world um, and 75% of them, yes, including you, <laughs> um, and 75% of them are autistic themselves. Um, we have bloggers, we have um, researchers, we have professionals, we have parents, we have all types of people uh, from, from all over the world. Um, and we have a week long event where you can tune in and watch all of them for free. Um, and we wanna basically spread understanding about autism to as many people as possible. Yeah. That's that's very cool. I was very uh, happy to be a part of it. My section is it's something something like oh, I can't remember what I what I wish I knew growing up. You know, having yep. a late diagnosis. Late. We talked a lot about my kind of awkward teenage years. Um, so um, I was very happy to to be a part of that, and I hope that you guys will um, go check it out. I mean, it is it's completely free, um, and the link is in the description box below. Um, but uh, so obviously you will uh, you will click on a, a video that is actually to do with autism and masking. And of course, masking is a very um, 2020 on brand kind of um, topic. But autistic masking and unmasking is probably one of the things that I get 
questions about the most. Um, I think it's something that particularly with autistic adults, we, um, the people who, who make it to adulthood before they get their diagnosis, I guess by definition have done masking. And so that's kind of like, it's a really, it's a really big and kind of um, a juicy topic in some ways, it's from like an intellectual perspective, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and it's something that is, is only really just being looked at by researchers and, and professionals. You know, the last, the, the last revision of the DSM, it, it now mentions masking. So kind of professionals know to look out for that. Um, but there still isn't a lot of guidance on kind of like how, you know, how you how you mask and how you unmask and should you and would you and could you kind of thing. So um, I think it, I th I'm really excited to be to be talking to you uh, today, because as I understand it, that's kind of like something that that you have done. And so you were diagnosed age 30. Was masking a big part of your life growing up? What age did it start and, and did it kind of taper off before your diagnosis? Or is it just something that you did until you didn't? Um, yeah, that's that's always a funny question. Um, before, <laughs> before I realized I was on the spectrum, masking was just called coping, <laughs> right? It was just called fitting in and having friends and keeping a job and all of these really everyday things. Um, and in hindsight, the biggest effect it had on me was I, I learned from a really young age that my emotional reactions were inappropriate. Yeah. And therefore, I needed to suppress them all. Um, now, that's not a very healthy thing to do. Uh, the, yeah. the healthiest thing to do with emotions is find uh, a, a healthy way to express them, right? Um, and this is part of my special interest of emotional intelligence um, that I that I ended up learning just like as a coping strategy to, to figure out how, how can I relate to everyone around me. Um, yeah, so as I, when I started understanding autism and started looking back at my own life, I started realizing how heavily I was relying on certain things to, as like a gimmick, essentially. It's almost like my facade was a party trick yeah. that was really simple and really easy and really popular and got me by and worked in all of these ways. But there's a kind of ironic thing that happens with masking that it, if people accept you for your mask, it feels like a rejection because you thought you kind of think, and I don't know if anyone else has this experience, but I, I kind of felt like if they really understood who I really was, was behind the mask, surely I would be rejected. Yeah. So ironically, by creating this social persona that was doing really well, internally I was feeling as though I'm no one no one would accept me if they if they really if they saw behind if that makes sense yeah absolutely i went through kind of the same thing um myself my i i mean i guess i'm kind of saying what you just said my mantra was actually like fake it till you make it and i remember being about 17 or 18 or kind of leaving school and just thinking okay fake it till you make it that sounds reasonable um at some point i will make it <laughs> um yep. and then you know 10 years later 12 years later i'm thinking wait a minute you know why am I still faking this? This still isn't coming mm. naturally to me. Um, and that was kind of like around the time that I was sort of figuring out the the, the autism thing. Um, but I understand what you mean about, you know, it's in some ways, if you're good at masking, it's like, it's easy, it works. And, you know, you there are autistic people who can be very popular because of masking. Um, but knowing that it's not you and knowing how much energy it takes is really sort of like, you know, you really think, well, no one's going to like me if I'm very quiet or if I am very upfront and if I don't make everybody laugh and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's kind of um, a double edged sword in in and that it, respect. And it ends up kind of isolating you from the world as well, because you stay in the world while you've got the energy to mask and then. I would run out of energy eventually and I'd say, well, I guess I can't be around people anymore. I'll have yeah. to withdraw by myself. And then and then I'd have people saying, what's wrong? What, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm okay. I'm just 
recharging because talking to people and going out and doing everything that I thought I needed to do to interact with the world was just so tiring that I, I just couldn't do it for very long. So it yeah. just wasn't a sustainable solution in that way. And it also kind of makes you feel like uh, all of your interactions by yourself is this kind of like very isolated place rather than a sort of positive place. And all of your interactions with the outside world is a very exhausting place rather than thinking like you could have meaningful interactions with other people, potentially genuine interactions, or you could have, you know, being at home doesn't have to mean being exhausted and recharging. It can be something that is kind of a great a great sort of value to your life as well. Um, so um, we we were writing down some notes about things to discuss and, and you said, ask me about my dreadlock story, which is like, okay. <laughs> so Paul, tell like, me about your dreadlock cool. story. Um, so this actually has uh, a lot to do with my diagnosis story as well, because um, when, I, when I discovered I was on the spectrum, and, and I really use that word intentionally discovered uh, because it, it, you know, it felt like something that I stumbled across myself by accident. Um, I started coming face to face with all my coping strategies and I realized that my hairstyle, I had dreadlocks for 15 years at that time, which was slightly more than, well, which was about half my life at that time. Um, all of my adult life, put it that way. And I started realizing how heavily I had lent on this literal mask to project a persona to the whole world. So the, the story behind them is that um, one day I was 16 and I was literally just starting to, you know, make some friendship connections and I'd met some people at a, at a school down the road and, you know, just starting... And um, someone said, can I give you dreadlocks? And I said, what are dreadlocks? Anyway, so, I, so I, I had dreadlocks from that day for the next 15 years, right? And it radically changed how other people perceived me, right? So I went from being, you know, a, a, an awkward, pimply teenager with braces, right, um, to all of a sudden people started thinking I was cool. People started talking to me. People started inviting me to places. And it just, the way other people perceived me radically changed literally overnight, literally overnight from one, from one day to the next. Yeah. Um, and by, by my 17th birthday, all of a sudden I had friends and I was learning. I was thrown into the deep end of this social world and I had to start learning to swim pretty quickly because I just I just didn't know what to do in, in all of those in all of those situations. But what I found is that the dreadlocks gave other people an instant connection point, an instant talking point. And everyone could come up and strike up a conversation about my hair, which was at the time in that in in you know my group you know, relatively uncommon. Um, and it was the same every time. Every time I went out to a party, I'd have the same conversations and it would be easy for me. And I, and I started getting more and more comfortable being around people that I didn't know and, and having conversations and, and all of those kind of things because it started be, being really regular and predictable and confidence building for lack of a better word, right? People wanted to interact with me and wanted to get to know me. And when they gave me the chance, then I did really well. Fast forward 15 years and I'm realizing I was basically using these dreadlocks as like a party trick to project this image of confidence and I don't know who I am without them because I've never not had them. I've, I've in my, like I said, my entire adult life from age 16 to 30, I looked like I did. What would people, what would happen if I took them off? So I have a bit of a um, extreme uh, growth mentality and personal development bent 
to, to me. So as soon as I found something that I knew I had to overcome, I'm like, right, that's it. So I committed to raising some money and shaving my head uh, for charity, uh, which I did. Um, and the video of me shaving off my dreadlocks on camera is still on YouTube. <laughs> it's pretty intense, um, not for the vulnerability squeamish, <laughs> um, but it was it was a huge thing to attempt to interact with the world without my safety net anymore. Intellectually, I knew I wasn't an awkward 16 year old anymore, right? I had a lot of experience. I had a lot of confidence. I had a lot of social knowledge and I'd, I'd worked out all of these things and I knew I didn't need to lean on these as a crutch anymore. But throwing away a crutch you know intellectually you don't need is still really scary. So it's an emotional crutch, isn't it? Not, not an intellectual one. So, um, yeah. so that, that's that's really interesting that you had that kind of very um, physical thing that um, was like a safety, I guess, a safety blanket or something. Because yeah. I don't, I'm just trying to think. I don't think I I had anything like that other than just trying to look as normal as possible, like very kind of conventional beauty standards and like, like I need to look normal, I need to fit in. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I don't actually think that worked very well. So for me, masking was more on the, on, along the lines of kind of learning about you know, how to st sustain conversations. Like people always want to talk about themselves. So when I'm feeling really, really anxious and I don't know what else to say, I will just ask people questions about themselves, which sometimes it works. And some people, sometimes it comes across a little bit intense, like I'm kind of interviewing them or something, you know, at a yeah. social situation. Um, but I also noticed that when I kind of relaxed and was just more myself, I, you know, I had a lot of social rejection and that's not just in the kind of really, extreme way but um in the sense of uh so for example i went to a party and one of the one of the people there that i met uh worked in um not video games but like gambling machines he was in the gambling machine industry right so me being me i guess thinks that it would be a fantastic opportunity to start a really intense discussion about game theory and the psychology of gambling, all right? This is just like a random party. And, you know, and I think I remember mentioning this to a friend later and he was just like, people don't want to talk about game theory at parties. But literally this was before my diagnosis. I'm like, but why not? Why, why not? don't they do this? <laughs> Isn't that what's fun, right? Um, so that was kind of in my late twenties. And that was when I was starting to sort of realize that, um, okay, so it works, but it's really exhausting when I do it. Sometimes it doesn't even work. But then when I stop doing it, something going is going wrong. Yeah. So is this just like a failure? Is this a personal failure? And that's really when, you know, depression kind of <laughs> gets in. When you, when you start thinking that actually, that this is something that yeah. you've done wrong just, just by existing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting that the, autistic reaction and the way we think about masking is so stereotypically autistic. It's like, it's so black and white. Well, I tried taking off the mask and it didn't work. So I'll put it back on again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tried wearing it and it didn't work and it's really tiring. So I'll just throw it in the bin. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty clear that both of those extremes have significant issues. Yeah. Precisely. And and for me, I mean, I kind of made it a habit. Like you, I was always into the kind of personal development, self-improvement. But I mean, as a teenager, I've read some of my old teenage diaries. I used to keep lots of diaries and I, I wouldn't call them New Year's resolutions. Like I, I've, I've called them New Year's beratements because essentially I was telling myself, this is what's wrong with you. You need yeah. to fix it. Um, and it was, you know, it was like insecure teenage girl stuff. But it was very much done in a way that wasn't like, here, would you like to grow? And is this the goal yeah. you're trying to achieve? It was like, there, you're wrong. Please fix yeah. yourself, fix your mask kind of. Yeah. Um, so these are habits. These are kind of mental habits that I think are very hard. It's very hard to get out of that. And I think the thing that helps me with that was just a lot of therapy actually. 
to be perfectly honest. You know. Yeah. Um, so you said that you you cut when you cut off your your locks. What is the um, was that the immediate unmasking point? Is did it kind of force you to unmask, or what happened after that? No, it was massive anticlimax. Nothing changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> On the outside, for other people, nothing changed. Obviously, for myself, it was just confirmation that I didn't need that particular look in order to get by in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess confirmation that masking is not just about that physical mask. There's so much more to it than that. So um, I remember one day just being so fed up with anything that I literally wrote it on the whiteboard in my room. I will not pretend to be okay. I will never say I'm fine when I'm not fine because I was just not fine. And the most triggering thing that someone could say to me is, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> so trying to hide that from the world was so draining. And I felt, um, what's the word? I just, it, it just wasn't, uh, it was the opposite of healing to try and keep all of that in for myself. I needed to find a socially appropriate way to be more of myself. And, and as you sort of alluded to before, this is a bit of a, a, a gradual process. Like how do I be just a tiny little bit more authentic to mm. myself? Um, and so I went to a script. I'm like, what script can I use when someone says, how are you? and I don't want to answer. And the script that I, that I came up with is I will say, pass, next question. <laughs> and that made it really clear that I'm not just going to say I'm fine. I'm not fine. Pass on that question. Do you have another one? <laughs> maybe, maybe another more interesting question. Um, so See, I would struggle with scripts yeah. like that because I'm so uh, conflict averse that to me that already sounds like way yeah. too, that's way too aggressive. I would never say something like that. But it's it's probably more assertive than aggressive, right? You know, mm. there's a there's a line. It's really and it's really challenging. Something I I learned uh, relatively recently is that neurotypical people freak out when you go off script. If, if they say, how are you, and you do not say fine, they go, uh-oh, I don't know what's wrong, but you were supposed to say fine. It's like you're on stage or something. You're like, it's your line. It's your line. Yeah. You're supposed to say fine. I, you're going off script. I don't know what to do now. And so, you know, when when I would go, you know, be at, at, at a party or something, and instead of saying, what do you do, I would say, I don't know, what's your superpower or something, it would really freak people out. They just wouldn't know how to respond. They're like, you're supposed to say what do you do? And I'm supposed to say, I'm a teacher. What do you do? And then we're supposed to do that small talk for five minutes and then never speak to each other again. That's how you go to a party, obviously. Sounds pretty boring, to be honest. <laughs> that actually reminds me of um, a few years ago, I went to this networking event. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's just kind of embarrassing, actually. The woman asked, where are you from? And this is a business kind of networking event. Yep, Where are you yep. from? And I, and I go, oh, well, um, you know, I was born here, but I've lived here and here and here. And, you know, I I'd, I'd carried on for a while because it's not a simple. And my mom is Danish yep, and yep, blah, blah, yep. blah. Um, and then she pauses and she goes, what publication are you from? <laughs> it's like, OK, not only do they just really over explain that, but I just completely mm -hmm. failed at being normal and giving the appropriate answer. And I really try sometimes. Um, so, yeah, like you said uh, about this whole kind of incremental unmasking, this gradual process of how I can be, how can I be a little bit more authentic every single time? Um, you know, for me, I've, it's only been a year and a half since my diagnosis. And so this has been, it's, it's quite new. And obviously most of 2020 has been kind of without regular social contact in the way that we are used to. Um, but some of the things that I've, I've been doing are choosing the trusted people 
that I can kind of experiment on, as it were. Um, and, you know, there are some people, and, and intellectually I say to myself, look, this person has shown that they like you and they want to be around, so maybe just try and relax around this person. Because I, for me, masking is not relaxing. It's this constant state of basically performance. You know, it's like I'm live on the internet right now, except I actually feel quite relaxed now. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's less relaxed. It's more relaxing for me to be live than it is to be pretending around people because I'm trying to get them to not just like me, but accept me and and not think I'm immediately strange. Um, and so for me, th this sort of gradual stuff means kind of identifying safe people, which I think is probably a good idea mm -hmm. anyway to make sure that you are you know, spending your time with people that you feel safe around. Um, but, you know, I've noticed that uh, part of masking can involve making very exaggerated facial expressions because I'm trying to mirror them in some way. Um, over animated conversations, uh, putting in a lot of energy to the conversation, especially if I'm tired, I find I actually put more energy in to compensate because otherwise I'd be talking to them like, okay, yeah. And, you know, I wouldn't give that back and forth that I'd want. Um, so it's it's really just identifying the things that you do when you're feeling, you know, when you are masking. And and mm. for me, that's been kind of saying, okay, well, you don't need to smile constantly while they're talking. You don't need to, to do all these things and, and little by little kind of stop yourself from, from doing it. Um, so did you have any strategies for unmasking? What, and if so, what, what were they? I'll think about that. The thing that 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 came to mind as as you were speaking um, has just gone from my mind, but will come back if I just keep saying random words. Um, you were you were talking about uh, what did you just performing. say? Performing. Performing. Yeah. So, in in some ways. Um, we need to be, you can't just be completely 100%, like how you behave when you're at home by yourself is always going to be slightly different to how you behave when you're around other people, just, just sort of by, by the nature of the things. Um, and one thing I found to be really helpful is, and, and the whole understanding autism helped immensely in this area, was just understanding what I needed and what I wanted. And what took a lot of energy and what was more relaxing for me. And then once I know what those things are, then I can start trying to find socially acceptable ways to allow myself to do those things in public. So let's take eye contact, for example, right? I might, um, a big one, so... I, I can usually do enough eye contact that people don't mind so much. Like it's not as much as most people, but it's sort of enough that it's not really a problem. Yeah. Um, but especially in like a noisy pub or something, like the only way I can listen is by like listening. <laughs> it doesn't look like I'm listening. So if I just have a, a, a little bit of an explanation, like if I do this, it means that I'm listening. Or sometimes I shut my eyes because it helps me to listen or some, you know, I just try and explain a little bit. I don't even need to use the word autism because very often using the word autism just goes off on a massive tangent because they have no idea what autism means anyway. And unless you plan on explaining it, then it's not going to be very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Whereas I can say something like I'm in, I'm in a meeting in an office room with, you know, back when we used to do that. And I can, I can get up from my chair and say, you know, I've been sitting down all day. It's a lot better for my back if I'm sort of standing or, you know, so I'm just going to pace up and down here. Hope that's okay. And most people will say, yeah, sure, that's that's okay. And Yeah, so it's like sudden, giving little mini explanations for your behaviour hmm. in a way that will understand, that people will understand without being like, I'm autistic, I have to walk around, or I'm autistic, I can't yeah. hear what you're saying, you know. And in a way that they can understand what's actually going on, even if it's not something that they need. So I will find that I'm the only one getting up and stretching in a meeting, but it's still okay. Um, and I've, you know, even even really professional meetings with, you know, 
high level government people, it's still fine. They still yeah. understand. And it's not a, it's not a massive accommodation. And even if they know nothing about autism, it's still something that I can relatively easily. I mean, it's a bit challenge. You have to be quite assertive with these things and it takes a lot of self-confidence and trying to learn how to build your self-confidence is a completely other topic that we yep. <laughs> might touch on, but is, a, is, is challenging. Um, but back to what you said before, I really like the um, focus on using safe people to practice around. And the safest person to practice around is yourself. <laughs> and when you're by yourself and, and I'm starting to realize the kind of things that I do when I'm by myself, the kind of ways that I sim when I'm by myself and then notice this is an emotional intelligence self-awareness thing. Again, notice how does my behavior change when I'm in a different situation? Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what would happen if I allowed myself the same behavior or similar behavior that I naturally do when I'm by myself or a version of that in front of another person. And yeah. it might be just your immediate family or, or your closest friend or, or something. Um, but it it feels qualitatively different to bring another human being into that, even if it's only one person. And then it starts to feel like, yeah, this is me. This is what I, this is who I am. This is what I like. This is how I like to be. Mm. And then when you choose to not be that version of yourself, then it's a conscious choice. And it, there's, there's a lot of power in having the conscious choice of this is the kind of person I am going to be in this moment. Yeah. And I really like the phrase, it's an authentic version of yourself. Mm. Because we because have so many. Kind of, so that's complicated. kind of what neurotypicals do as well, isn't it? You know, they have different versions of themselves, a professional exactly. version or, you know, the customer service version or something like that. And so that doing that in itself, that's not, harmful in the way that constantly masking is yeah the harmful thing about constantly masking is always is either being an inauthentic version of yourself as opposed to an authentic version of yourself or just never having the opportunity to have the level of freedom that your body needs to express its emotions and express yourself to an adequate degree yeah. um, and, and what ends up happening is if we start suppressing how we're feeling um, it has really big negative impacts on our health and our emotional health and our psychological health um, so finding more ways to e be expressive um, and that might be through art or that might be through stimming or that might be through um, I don't know, creating something else, but you know, it's all it's all really important to try and find more ways to do that. And and what I find is, it's because it, the the autistic experience is of conforming ourselves so heavily that it's a problem. Obviously, conforming a little bit is okay, but conforming ourselves so heavily is a problem. And also, feeling like we don't have a choice. And that we have to conform so heavily otherwise we'll be excluded that's the the kind of really damaging um idea that we that we build up on the inside if our mask is too strong and um yeah, yeah. And, and i think that feeling really comes hand in hand with the with with being undiagnosed and mm. kind of not knowing, not knowing why, why do you want to stim? I mean, for years, like one of my, you know, self New Year's beratements was, was like, stop biting your nails, stop doing all these things that of course now I know is stimming um, because I didn't know why I needed to do them. As far as everyone else told me, it's bad habits. And so mm. I thought I just had a load of bad habits and mm. stimming is something that I kind of, I never thought, oh, it's, it's probably why I never, even thought that I was autistic throughout a psychology degree um, because the way that I stim is, you know, it's it's subtle, but it's very necessary. Um, and mm. if somebody tells me just sit still and stop fiddling, you know, then that's it that, you know, I'm kind of shut down. 
Um, and, and so you, you briefly mentioned like stimming being one of those things. That's something that for me has been a part of my unmasking because I'm just saying, okay, well, you like to have something to do with your hands all the time. So stim toys seem like something that's just, oh, it's cool, quirky autism or whatever, but I really like them and they really help. And um, I also am looking into the, the chewing stuff because it was one of those things where, you know, I was just absentmindedly those uh, little squiggly hair tie things that you can also chew on. Um, and I noticed I was I was sitting there chewing on it and my husband came downstairs into the room and immediately I stopped doing it. And I noticed myself mm. stopping myself. My husband is, he's got ADHD, you know, he's neurodivergent in his way. Um, you know, he doesn't mind if I do that. But I noticed it was the reaction. Then I realized that I have this urge to hide it. Mm. And I, mm. I don't know where it's come from because I don't remember being particularly chastised for mm. it it's just from seeing, from observing, from observing mm. what happens to other people who don't fit into the norm, what happens to other people um, who do these things, and then realizing that that you need to to change, and um, mm. and I've also found that I've started being almost annoyingly upfront about my autism to people. Um, sometimes when it's not necessary, you know, it's like that meme where like nobody dot 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 me. By the way, I'm autistic, kind of thing. But, <laughs> I I think that for me that's kind of a protection that the, the unmasking is a protection it's saying look mm. this is who I am I'm not I'm not telling you lies about that I'm being upfront now and and I think that's probably that kind of radical unmasking has come from this uh you know trauma from past friendships that have gone wrong um mm. where people have really like almost willfully misunderstood my intentions and stuff like that so so I guess I'm as part of having a YouTube channel where I talk very openly is kind of like trying to be more open in real life and mm. also just being very casual about it. So mentioning it to people, not just your closest friend, but saying, yes, I'm autistic so that they build up a different idea of what autistic people can look like yeah. in, you know, in real life, not just in the movies or something like that. And there's, um, there's, there's also neurotypical stim as well. Like, let's just put it yeah. out there. Everybody, everybody does. If you've ever seen someone like flick a pen in a lecture theater or something, right? It's, it's really common. Um, and some, so, so um, there's, there's a couple of things that came to mind. So, so firstly, getting involved in the autistic community and meeting other people and saying, Oh, you're doing that thing. That looks kind of cool. Can I try that stim toy? Or can I, you know, um, it, it kind of validates that these kind of these things are okay and that these things are interesting and it's it's something you can explore. And I know I've definitely learned a lot from just seeing how other people deal with things and saying, look, if it works for you, I might try it and see what it's like. And maybe it'll be something that I like and maybe it won't be. Um when I was, and an, I used to work as an engineer, and I would always have a pen in my hand, right? Just always. And nobody thought twice about it. So it, it, it's, not, it's not always something that is, if we find socially acceptable ways to do these things, then it, it can, we don't always need to hide, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and and all of these kind of socially acceptable things can be can still just work in a kind of self-regulatory way. Like you don't need special toys, um, you know. You just things that can blend in. I mean, I was always I don't know if my microphone's just gone a little bit loud or something. Um, I was always I thought that I just had very childish taste when it came to like I really liked oh, yeah. glitter and sparkly things and stuff like that. Obviously, like I've got my little uh, I don't know. It's not really a galaxy light. I feel like a bit, a bit ripped off from the description. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, like I just thought that I, yeah, I was I was being childish. And and obviously now I realize that kind of like visual, visual stimming is important. And it's not just, oh, I'm gonna go out and buy loads of glittery things. It's like, okay, well, lighting is very important to me. So mm -hmm. I have to make my, instead of just ignoring my house, cause you know, we moved in a few years ago and still we don't have lights up in, <laughs> various places um but really realizing that, that actually lighting is important and not just lighting that is functional but lighting that makes me feel like oh i'm in a kind of cool 
exciting place or I, I don't know I don't know why I, I like the twinkly lights kind of thing um that's yeah. something that's that's kind of uh I don't know a lot about actually the visual stimming um and and just what you said before a lot of that is just giving ourselves permission to do what we feel right. like doing and the hard part about that is it's a massive identity shift to suddenly become like the kind of person who insert whatever you're thinking of here right that that's a massive identity um, shift to allow yourself to be the kind of person that likes sparkly things yeah. <laughs> right is that is that okay with you that you yeah. that you do that if if it's not okay with you then it's going to be hard to like the first that's the first step like ourselves as a first step the next step is like the cl people close to us and then public strangers that's that's the hardest part yeah um somebody um put oh, actually i can draw up the comments can't i hold on let me try the, doing this Stimming by oh. playing with blue tack, anyone says uh, potato. And I oh, used yeah. to do that as a teenager. Like I would create intricate little uh, snails basically and twirl them round and round and round. That was like really a big one. And, and now I've got that uh, thinking putty stuff and it's just, just as good except it's less gross. So I would not have thought that, but I'm looking guiltily over at my desk <laughs> and going, oh, maybe. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> now that yeah. I think about it. Um, sorry, I haven't had much of a chance. I've been so engrossed in the conversation. I haven't had much of a chance to look at the comments. Um, this person here, okay, Schnee Roseful. I stim with pens, phone cables, necklace pendants, etc. Sometimes if I grab something to stim in a meeting, my colleagues pass me things to fidget as they already noticed that quirk. That's nice. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a healthy work environment. Um, oh, quickly, better take that off before it goes. Um, Let's see, I love wearing a ring so I can fidget with it without anyone noticing and my partner likes to play with it too, which fortunately is a nice feeling. Yeah, and you can actually get spinning rings specifically mm. to fidget with. Um, we have got, um, oh, a super chat from Miro Hundak. Thank you so much. All you talk about really hits me in the feels. Oh, well, I'm glad that you're enjoying you're enjoying our, um, our live today. Um, I can't remember actually where you're based, but... Um, you're one of my one of my special members. Um, this person, Carla Grace. Any tips for university or organizing? I'm struggling a lot to stay focused and keep to a plan. Um, <laughs> that's a huge, huge topic. I I've got a video coming out next week about kind of like a post summer holiday reset um, and you know planning out for the next three or four months. So. For me personally, I always, at school, I always took it in terms uh, or semesters, you know, three months I think is a perfect block of time. And you start by looking at the big picture, the things that you have, have to stretch into that big block of time and then breaking it down, you know, monthly, weekly and daily. Um, but do check out, I've got, already had two kind of executive functioning videos out and my third one in the series is out next week. I haven't decided which day yet. Um, now, how do we get my redo on the, this? On the, on the masking topic, like it's this is not just how we behave around others in public. It's also mm -hmm. how we let ourselves behave because of who we think we should be. So, I, I, like, it's such a such a huge topic, and this like idea of planning and just doing what actually works for you. So there can be a lot of shame and a lot of stigma around, well, you know what works for me? Going to bed at 9 p.m., that works for me, for example. Uh, or being super strict with a schedule. Or, you know, I've, um, uh, I, I have a video that I, I literally ate the same thing for lunch every day for several years, right? <laughs> it worked. It was like the best part of my day. My, I would leave up, so two, two really basic everyday luxuries that I would have was making myself a coffee and sitting under the, the tree outside and walking to the bakery, getting a fresh bread roll and having the same super sandwich. And making the video was fun too, because I show people how to make it. But every day, but just 
most people can't understand that and wouldn't really get on board with it. But allowing ourselves to do things that work is, is part of the self-acceptance that allows us to start being more authentic in more situations, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's no, it's funny that you use that as an example because um, it's when I when I talk to you about things like that um, and you mentioned, you know, you did the same thing every day and you had this just look of pure, sheer joy on your face. And I'm like, that sounds horrendous to me. And I, and I think that this is like sort of why I'm building up this kind of, okay, when do I go to the doctor for the ADHD assessment? <laughs> because like the idea of that kind of, I love routines, but I can't stick to them every day because I get super bored. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know theoretically the idea of wearing the same thing every day, it's super helpful. You don't need to keep making decisions, but I can't imagine the kind of it, under stimulation I would get from that. It's, it's only helpful if you do not like the process, if you are not trying to express yourself in the clothes that you wear and you don't feel any different, no matter which clothes you wear, then why waste mental energy on it? Mm. But if you feel different by wearing your favorite top, then all of a sudden there's a secondary purpose to the clothes that you're wearing. It's like an expression, it's like a choice, it's it's something that's actually right. adding life to wear something different every day. But I mean, so, if, you, if you think about food, I still can't eat the same thing every day, mm -hmm. you know? And it's funny though, because my husband who is not diagnosed autistic, he said uh, early on in our relationship, I was kind of horrified. He was like, I could eat spaghetti bolognese every day for a week. We could just make whole batches. And I'm sitting there like, I have to eat something new every day. <laughs> I, I have to plan a different menu every week. I can't even keep the same weekly menu. <laughs> but we made it work, I guess. Well, we're still married, so. Um, yeah. Right. Um, let's see. Um, I've got just a super chat from Eric Bosman. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's no comment. So hi, Eric, thank you. Um, let's, um, okay, here's a good question. I'm not diagnosed yet and I'm thinking about whether I'm autistic or not. Can you mask all your life without realizing you were doing it? Um, yes, I think, yeah. Most. Um, Definitely. The, the most damaging masking is unfortunately the one that we're not even conscious of um, because it just, you, you can't actively work against something if you don't even know it's there. And, and I've definitely heard this story from a lot of people like, who am, who am I without the mask? And I asked myself this question when I took off the dreadlocks, who am I? if I don't have my personality, I'm losing my entire personality here. Yeah. <laughs> so who, who is, who, what's left if I take it away? Yeah, that kind of comes up to, um, to the next, um, the next topic uh, with regards to kind of what unmasking or what masking means for our identity, because masking is something that, I mean, I, I, you know, you build it up as a child. I, I think I started building it up as a child. You learn how to act, what is appropriate, and then it becomes sort of more complex. Um, and then during your teenage years, you know, typically that's when people experiment, people discover what kind of a person they are. They maybe go in with different groups, different interests. And, um, and so if you've spent your whole life sort of masking to fit in without really exploring yourself mm. then when it comes to taking it away you can really have a kind of identity crisis not knowing like am I an extrovert or am I an introvert even what what do I actually like doing and this can be I think some people take it to extremes you know that they they think well do I even like playing games or was it just that this is the group that accepted me in school or, mm -hmm. or whatever um and just talking about kind of like 2020, the, the lockdown period, um, which has, well, I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but you know, it's a significant period of stress for everybody. 
And I found myself reverting back to teenage comforts and teenage interests. I would watch the shows on TV that I watched as a teenager that were my special interests. And I started playing guitar again. And I started getting back into these these hobbies that I, I kind of like rediscovered myself in a way. That sounds rather, you know, I, I because when I was a teenager, I was I was very isolated and I spent a lot of time in my bedroom because well, for various reasons, but you know, and so like I but I I built up this very comfortable, safe place where I was playing guitar and, and writing songs and um, you know, I, I just kind of like enjoyed my own company. And then it was it was after that that I started becoming thinking like this is not acceptable. And so during mm -hmm. 2020, I've kind of rediscovered that. And I think it's actually been okay, my mental health's been up and down a little bit, but um overall the journey I've been on has made me realize like, yes, I actually kind of like being by myself in the evenings. You know, I used to think, oh, well, I have to spend time with my husband. And it's like, actually, he just wants to go and play computer games and I just want to practice guitar. So it's it's okay that we don't want to spend every single evening just gazing into each other's eyes. Like that's okay. We both need that time to recharge. Um, and so that's kind of like, I. For me, I felt that the more I've unmasked, the more my identity has kind of gone back. And I recognize parts of myself from earlier that I'd hidden because I was ashamed. Um, mm. What do you think about what it means, what it's meant for your identity? How did you rediscover or discover mm. the person that you are? Yeah, so, so shame can play a huge role there because if i if i see something in myself and i attach any shame to that behavior or desire or anything then it's so easy to sort of push it away and say oh that's not me that's childish or that's this yeah. or that's something else um so yeah i guess i guess for me personally it's 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 a nice process to continually discover new things about myself um and to know that my identity is something that is evolving and to just be free to let it do that without worrying that i'm gonna turn out to be the wrong type of person if that makes sense there's a lot of yeah. fear in that probably drilled into me from a very young age th that there is such a thing as a wrong type of person <laughs> Yeah. And that it might be you if you're not careful, if you don't conform to this rigid standard. So, yeah, I, I think sometimes it's it's just about just allowing yourself to experiment with things. I find testing things and experimenting with things and playing with, with things and ideas is a much safer way to explore your identity because oh, why are you playing Dungeons and Dragons tonight? Oh, it's just, a, I'm just seeing what it's like because I've never experienced it before. It's, I'm not the kind of person that would do that. I'm just seeing what it's like. And then if it turns out that you're, you you know, it, it sparks something, you're like, oh, actually, I might like to do this again next week. Yeah. <laughs> well, that it, it it's, you never really know until, until you actually go out and allow yourself to experience, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just all about learning the freedom to just believe that everything's okay. I'm okay. And I'm not broken. I'm okay. Yeah. Whatever I do does not change that fact, which gives me the freedom to, to try different things and find out what works for me and incorporate the parts that I want to incorporate. And if I don't want to be a type of person, I get to choose. I don't want to be that type of person. I want to do this instead. Like I have, there's a, there's a real power and freedom in the conscious choice of who do I want to be as a person. Yeah. And I think it also gives you the power then to, if you're making a decision that you want to be this kind of a person, it also gives you kind of permission to forgive your your past self and yeah. forgive yourself for things that you did that maybe you were very out of character 
or you know they just that you did them for reasons that you didn't fully understand and so kind of like building up your identity as an adult as what happens you know for you and maybe for me as well like this this sense of very um intentional deciding uh you know what are your what are your values what are your priorities what do you like to do who do you like to spend time with um you know knowing that you're kind of doing that for me it makes me think okay like i did this in the past because i was essentially walking around um you know pretty much blind to who i was and and that's you know that's a, that's a difficult um that's a difficult place to be and being undiagnosed is incredibly difficult um and uh can lead people to act in very strange ways because you know, I, I think I made a video on this last year about why autistic people can seem two-faced or something. It's because right. you're desperately trying to fit in over here and you're desperately trying to fit in over here. And somehow these two faces make somebody think that you are kind of intentionally duping them or right. something when, when really you are just responding to trying to use all the strategies that, that you've learned. Um, so we've been kind of, um, We've been talking a lot about kind of the, the unmasking. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about kind of necessary masking because there is a reason why we learned to do it in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that there will always be an amount of necessary masking, um, especially for for certain communities. So what what do you think that that might be? Um I, I prefer to use different language around it. Um, okay. I, I, I would, so there's there's such a thing as a, a socially constructed self. Maybe you did that in your psychology. But um, it, it's, it's the acknowledgement that in a society, when we are dealing with other people, we bring a version of ourselves to that and we leave some of it out. We leave some of it, we keep some of it private even. So it's not inauthentic to be a certain version of yourself. You're just bringing the relevant parts of yourself to the table and you're keeping the irrelevant parts for this situation private for, for lack of a better word, right? So when I'm in a professional setting, I don't need to tell everyone about my personal hobbies. It's it's not necessarily something that I'm bringing here. Like, whereas if I, so so I play the drums, for example, right? I, I really enjoy that. Um, in hindsight, it, it's really great stimming and gets so many, um, so much energy out and it's, it's great. Um, and so in some settings, I'm the drummer. Right, and that sort of forms my identity in that setting because that's the version of myself that I'm bringing. But in in a different setting, it, it's irrelevant what I do on the weekend or if I play an instrument or not. Right, so I'm bringing forward. I'm showing the relevant parts of myself in this situation, and I'm also. And this is a really key point that a lot of us, a, a lot in our community don't really understand. It took me a long time to figure out this. That's why we keep some things private because it's not, they're not appropriate. They, they are appropriate for us, but not in this situation. Hmm. So that means that oversharing uh, and saying, this is me, you have to accept me, um, often damages social relationships. And I think my, my theory around that, and, and this is definitely resonating from my experience, is that sometimes the reason we do that, and I'm interested if, if others, you know, resonate and, and agree with this, is because I've, I've held back myself so much that, I, that I, it just feels wrong and I want people to know me and I want people to say, yes, you're okay, that's good. But if I force that into a situation, it can look like oversharing or it can it can look like all of these other things that are leading to 
rejection very quickly, yeah. <laughs> which is ironically kind of um, keeping the cycle going. I've actually got a, a, a video on rejection and, and the cycle of rejection. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I've seen that one. Um, yeah, there's a lot of comments coming in around what you just said. Um, Holly Day says, I'm terrible at reading how much personal information is appropriate in which situations. Is that something we can learn? Definitely. Oh, no, up. Sorry. Definitely. It's, it's, it's hard because social interactions are, are relatively complex, um, but it is def th there is nothing about the autistic condition that prevents us from, from learning that if we are taught in a way that makes sense to us. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Very so not just, that, oh, no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear you talk yeah. about your exactly. drugs. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's not really helpful. Um, and very often the, the descriptions and the, the rules that neurotypicals tell us about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, it's, it, they're, not, they're not accurate. They, yeah. they don't give us a real sense of what's going on um, and what I what I learned around that as well is following the rules of everyone else puts you on the bottom rung of the social ladder because you imagine that if anyone tells you off they must be right and you must be wrong yeah and the more confidence you get slowly you start realizing actually I'm okay to do this it's fine I know I'm breaking this rule I'm breaking this rule on purpose because I know it's there for a reason. And I just couldn't give a stuff about the repercussions because it's important to me. <laughs> and yeah. this is who I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there's a lot of drummers actually here. Um, oh. Anna says, Paul, pay Paul plays drums, Sam plays a guitar. Did I hear that we can have an autistic rock band? Yes. We'll, call it, we'll, have, we'll have Neurovision. Somebody came up with this idea and I'm like, that's genius. Neurovision oh, contest, yes. Um, so Talia says, oh my gosh, it's not relevant what I did on the weekend, mind blown emoji. Um, yeah, I know, right? Sometimes it just seems very relevant to us. Um, but I guess it's about just learning different rules for different situations. Of course, the thing that I struggle with is that I kind of, I learn these rules about like, okay, when I was in my twenties and I was temping, okay, this is not appropriate in a work setting. And then it, I, it turns out that I was being over-professional and wasn't letting anybody in and I wasn't forming any relationships at work because everybody just thought I was extremely closed off, you know, so it kind of, it's a delicate balance. Um, and the heart, one of the hardest things for our community is to get that delicate balance. It's not all or nothing. It's not, I, it, it's not, don't mention the weekend or give someone a 45 minute explanation of Saturday morning. <laughs> It's how do I share a little bit about my life? And this is a, this is a social skill essentially uh, of conversation to share a little bit and then wait to see, does the other person ask for more information or not? Yeah. So if, if you say, how are you? And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. I've, I've had a busy week and they don't ask about the week, then they don't want to know. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't need to tell them everything if they're not interested that's kind of like uh me and youtube last year i was very like that was kind of my special interest was all the kind of stuff that i was doing learning about youtube and and someone in real life would meet me and they're kind of like what do you do i'm like i have a youtube channel and <laughs> and i'm like i really really want to tell you everything and mm. actually i was surprised at the amount of people who just don't care they go oh okay one, one person said um I think it was my dentist. Oh, as long as you don't make a video about me. And I'm like, I'm not gonna make a video about my dentist. And it's like, oh, actually people don't care. Um, and I, I'm sure there's a niche. There is a, a kind of a group of people who would be really interested. And that is, I guess the people who are here today, thank you for watching. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of difficult to, to really um, stomach the fact that actually people don't always care about the things that you're really interested in. When you care so passionately about something, it's really hard to accept the fact that someone else just doesn't. So yeah. all of us have some level of interest that's probably higher than, than the average population. Um, and it's it can be really hard to only share an appropriate amount about that. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, hold on. <laughs> Someone wants me in their band. Awesome. Oh. I'm, I'm really not that good. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm only on get acoustic at the moment. Uh, maybe in November, I'll treat myself to my first electric, <laughs> and then we'll see. Amsterdam, yeah. I could do that. I could be in a band. The Yo, Yo Bandy Band or something, I don't know. <laughs> Yo Bandy Band. <laughs> um, right, let's see uh, if we've got any more comments. And there was actually something that I still, I wanted to talk about um, with regards to necessary masking. Um, yeah, because you, you were talking about, you know, you don't have to share all these different parts of you. And I was wondering what you think about kind of, um, I guess it kind of comes under intersecting identities. When it, when it comes down to race or, uh, you know, being a kind of a, maybe a non-passing trans person, something that is, you can't hide it and, and kind of like how masking might provide safety in certain contexts. Um, and oh. I mean, for example, um, in the black community, there's, there's something called code switching, which is kind of like talking from the sort of African-American vernacular and then code switching means kind of like talking like white people essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it, mm -hmm. it's kind of like an acceptable way of presenting yourself. And it's got a lot of parallels to masking, mm -hmm. but for autistic people who, you know, like autistic trans people can't really hide the fact that they are trans, well, I mean, non-passing trans people, you know, a, yeah. if they can't hide that fact, that already puts them in a in a dangerous position. And, you know, how, how would people like that who are already perhaps vulnerable in public cope with kind of not mas masking, but not being inauthentic about it, you know, when it's for reasons of safety, maybe? Yes, one of the um, sort of rules of thumb that I that I use around disclosure and things like that is I kind of think if someone is going to notice anyway, I have to make sure that their assumptions are they're going to make assumptions. So some people, like you, you said, you used for example, um, you know non-passing trans right some people are obviously different maybe maybe your voice is so different that people know that there's you know you, you know they hear it in your voice or maybe your posture or maybe your eye contact or something is different enough that the, the second people meet you they're like oh what's 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 going on with you right um people make assumptions about us every millisecond, right? It's just human nature that, that we do that. And in that sense, we need to help people to make helpful assumptions about us. And so sometimes in that sense, giving people more information is helpful. Whereas for someone else who would otherwise just be passing and flying under the radar, there's no, there's no need to bring up a complicating factor if it wasn't there. Yeah. So I'm talking to someone on the phone. I, I'm, you know, someone mistakes my gender on the phone. Yeah, it happens all the time. No, I'm, it doesn't for me, but you know, for someone, maybe it happens all the time. I don't need to correct them. It's fine. Finish the conversation. I'm not going to speak to them again anyway. Is that a battle worth fighting? Right. Whereas if it's something that people are obviously going to know about, I like, I personally like to head it off in advance. I know that it probably looks weird that I'm pacing up and down this meeting room. <laughs> Here's what's going on. Yeah. So that you, so that, so that you know what's going on. Um, but I think your question was sort of getting around like safety and should I try to mask or try harder to pass? for normal, uh, for lack of a better word, in a situation. Um, and my thought around that is if it's a conscious choice and it's something that you have the power to do, because there's a lot of power in passing if you mm. need to, right? There's there's a lot of privilege in passing if you yeah. need to and, and vice versa. 
So if that's something that I choose to do to exercise my power in this situation, then that's that's a that's a conscious choice, and that's a version of myself that I'm that I'm bringing forward. Um, yeah, and also I guess the fact is that um, you know autistic people vary so much in the way that they seem autistic. Some people might not seem autistic at all, unless you know what you're looking for, perhaps. And some people, like you said, they might have visibly atypical posture or complete lack of eye contact or vocal stims or something like that. And I guess the thing is, it's like, first of all, it's not always possible to correct all outward signs of, or correct, I say that, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, to I mean. normalize yourself, you know, it's not possible to make yourself seem completely normal, no matter how hard you try from, from the outside. And, and so it's like, you know, people will always have opinions about, uh, when I say people, I mean, just on, on the street, you know, we're not in a position where trans people can, are, are safe in general and the people, same people you know, in the US, what we've been seeing in the black community, like it's very clear that black people and especially black autistics are not safe but I don't know how much of that comes from saying, well, if 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 if, if they just act more normal, I, I don't think there's a responsibility of society as well. And I think that's why more education, more people talking about autism and just making this shift so we can get to a point where a kid, mm. whether black or you know, any any other race, stimming in public people know that that's autism because mm. people might think, you know, people might misinterpret it for a variety of different things. But if we really start to get a better generalized awareness of autism, I think that is something that we can, at least that's kind of what I'm working towards the, the, the indirect approach, I suppose. Um, it's, it, it would be nice to get there. It's definitely worth working towards, towards that. Um, but where, where, wherever we're at, um, the decision about masking, it's more, it's more about what is the reality of the social situation that I'm going to be in. Yeah. And if we learn, uh, if we can figure out how our behaviour is going to be interpreted and what kind of reactions that we're getting, then even just that knowledge gives us the power to maybe find a, a socially acceptable way to stim. Like I, I have a friend who who knits on the tram all the time, yeah. right? Because she has to keep her hands moving. And if she's just going like this, people think she's weird. So she just knits yeah. and it's completely fine. So um, it's more about and, redirection than suppressing. So yeah, so so redirection is definitely a strategy. Um, but it's it's not okay to just wish the current reality was different because it's not yeah. right now it's okay to work towards a different reality tomorrow that's that's really important but to to pretend that i should be able to 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 just know that i should be able to stim in public therefore i'm going to stim in public every every action has a consequence in in a social setting and if we understand what that consequence is then we can deliberately choose to break a social rule um, but when we accidentally break the social rules i find that that's the that's the the one that hurts our community the most because it's not a conscious it's not a calculated thing and then we end up getting punished really severely for breaking the rules because we didn't know what the punishment was going to be and we were just so sick of following all the rules that we decided I'm not following any of the rules and then we got really punished for it. Yeah. Um, so learning what the social rules are allows us the power to start breaking them in ways that are good for us and don't get us punished for it if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, Camille says, um, can dissociation be a stim or suppression of needing to stim?
Not sure. As in, um, like, as in, if you stop somebody thing? from stimming, I think that's what I think that's what she means. If you stop somebody from stimming, can a result be dissociation? I I think from the reason I put this up was because I I would say yes because if if I'm in an uncomfortable situation and somebody's saying stop fidgeting stop doing this sit still you know like at school or something I would try and take myself out of that situation okay so for, for me that is um, okay right where are we going um, this person says, I see dissociation as suppressed need for drum. Absolutely. <laughs> That's one answer to that. Um, I find okay. I found interestingly that my my stimming has changed quite significantly over the years. So I used to literally drum on everything unconsciously and it would drive people crazy. And they're like, stop tapping on that, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and now I've learned to, to stim more verbally. Um, and I find I don't tap on things anymore. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. But maybe that's maybe that's just as irritating. <laughs> I just well, no, I said that because I do more, it all the time, and I irritate probably, myself with verbal stims. So I was that wasn't. Uh, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to go when I have to try and socialize again. You know, after <laughs> COVID, it's a it's a running it's a running joke in my household. Like how that the way we behave, how are we ever going to go back into society? <laughs> Find autistic people to hang out with, I guess. Um, I can't actually pronounce maniacaish. I don't know how you'd say that name. One can't punish someone for rules they don't understand, or does that not make sense? To girls, there are many destructive rules that are impossible to handle, even for normal people. Um, I say you shouldn't, but I think it's entirely possible. I I always get seemingly punished for things that I don't understand. And I think that is almost possibly a, a universal experience of, of being autistic, actually. Yeah, it's like, what did I do wrong? Why am I getting punished? So yeah. often, often we know we've done something to elicit a negative reaction like why are you not talking to me why are you angry at me what what did i do to offend you right that's a punishment that's a social yeah. punishment um and if we don't know what we've done then that doesn't help anyone and then people say oh don't act like that you know what you did and i'm like, like yeah i totally know what i did remind me please <laughs> yeah yeah i've been in that situation uh, a few too many times um um, let's just have a look more about knitting and stuff like that. Um, so when, so you've been talking a lot about kind of the, um, well, you say the socially constructed persona, which is masking, but not, but masking for the right reasons. Um, I, I wrote down some ideas about kind of like what you can ask yourself to work out uh, kind of like what is good masking and what is bad masking. So the, the questions that I came up with is sort of like what expends too much energy because masking mm -hmm. is very, for me, it's very high energy and that's why I feel drained after social situations. Um, what makes you feel inauthentic? Um, what causes people to accuse you of being two-faced or, you know, malicious in some way when you're not intending that? And what ultimately doesn't serve you? Um, mm. I don't know if you have anything else to add about kind of like ways that people can work out, you know, um, because I've written here, masking is a sort of gamification of life. I don't know if anyone else mm. makes notes they don't <laughs> understand, but I feel I like masking. I understand that. It's a, every, <laughs> I, I, I turn, I'm very competitive and I'm like, this is a game. And I, as soon as I figure out the rules and as soon as I figure out how to maximize this situation, I'm going to win. <laughs> so, um, like I, I, I really love thinking about social situations in, in terms of like, this is what I'm trying to do and this is how, you know, it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but it's kind of fun to turn everything into a game. I think that's kind of, I, I suspect that's probably why so many uh, autistic people play The Sims because it's very much oh, like yeah. instant feedback 
um, you know, you do a social interaction and like you can see plus or minus. And so I played, I guess The Sims came out like when I was a teenager. I spent a lot of time as a teenager playing The Sims. Um, and I guess when I talk about the gamification of life, I suppose it's like when I have social interactions, I, I say something like do a funny joke or something. And then you see the reaction, you notice that and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do more funny jokes because they liked that. Or, okay, that didn't work. Let's talk about the weather or something. Um, so for me, yeah, for me, I find when I'm very heavily masking, I do, I, I think of it as a, as a game and I don't think about connecting with the person at all. Mm. Just probably, okay. you know, that's my fault maybe. This all this all comes back to to self awareness though. Um, I know I've said this a couple of times already, but knowledge knowledge is power. Self knowledge allows us to make a conscious decision that is in line with what we want, that is in line with our our values and our identity and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's not something that happens overnight. You, if you want self awareness, you have to work on it. You have to start deliberately noticing how do I feel did that go well um what do did I feel authentic like even just trying to answer the questions right those, those were really good questions that you were asking and if we have the self-awareness to answer them then you can actually make a decision of well I, I felt a little bit inauthentic here do I want to do that again mm. Not really. Okay, great. Well, that's good information. What can I do with that information? Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I get very analytical with these things. And where, where what do you think are the, the best ways to foster your, your own self-awareness? For me, I think it's been therapy and journaling mainly. Um, do you have any other um, ways or is it just kind of like your years of practice? So you can't get past practice. Practice is um, really helpful. But practicing what? What are you practicing? Mm. Um, if you actually have a practice, if you have some kind of self-reflection or meditation practice, if you have a journaling practice, if you have something, then um, that is something that will sort of pay off over time. Um, it's worth noting that... Um, you know, getting into the emotional intelligence side of it, um, self-awareness comes from noticing physically what's happening in your body. Like if you want to know if you're feeling inauthentic, you need to listen to how your body is reacting in a certain situation and say, is that anxiety? No, it doesn't feel quite like anxiety. I know what anxiety feels like and it's not quite that. It's something a little bit different. What is it like? Is it you know, what is it? And then and the, the, the more we um, tune in to how we feel in our bodies, getting a free emotional intelligence lesson here, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the easier it becomes to answer those questions and, and to learn that self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. Well, I think we are kind of approaching approaching the end of the conversation. Um, for those people who didn't join us right at the beginning, do you want to just quickly talk about the summit again? Because I'm sure some people have seen the link in the description and think, well, what is this? So just briefly describe what the um, Autism Explained Summit is. So massive online event on starts on the 21st of September. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, um, I have interviewed 25 um, autism experts from all over the world, um, and Sam being one of them. Um, so we, we talk about um, a lot of uh, really interesting interesting topics um, and it's it's broadcast as a free live event um, with where you can basically tune in during that week and uh, listen to the, the interviews on demand. So I'm really excited about that. It was lots of fun um, interviewing people and, and putting it all together. And um, as Sam just mentioned, there's a um, free registration link in the description. So. Yeah, so check that one out. And um, it's, uh, yeah, the 21st of September for five days, isn't it? Yeah. Yep, there are, there are five new speakers every day for five days. And um, so the, the, whole, the whole idea of the event is how do we take away all of the barriers to 
accessing content, right? So the first barrier is cost of an original of, of, of an event. So if you go to a conference, it's going to cost you a couple of hundred dollars. So it's free. Yeah. The second barrier is, well, you've got to get yourself there. So it's online. And then the third barrier is if you go to a live event, you have to actually be there at the time and listen to the presentation. So um, in this case, uh, every speaker is available. We've got, there's like a, 20, uh, a 48 hour window. And during that window, you can basically watch all the videos on demand whenever you want. So it takes away that barrier as well. Mm. So doing our best, trying to educate the world about autism and share as many autistic voices as possible. Great. Um, well, it's been so much fun to talk to you and I'm so glad we managed to work out a time that kind of was convenient for, for a, a lot of people. Um, and I've had a lot of people saying, this is the collab we've been waiting for. So <laughs> right. we might actually have a future little collab on Paul's channel at some point. Yeah. I feel like we've planned it right? <laughs> at some point and we actually haven't done, I haven't done any filming yet, so um, oops. Um, but yes, there may be something in the future, which is it will be more like a pre-recorded um, uh, kind of thing. But thank you so much to Paul for organizing this event, which I think is fantastic. And also for coming on my channel to talk to me and to uh, to talk to all of you guys. Um, I appreciate that there's still 262 people here after almost an hour and a half. So it yeah, must wow. have been a pretty good conversation. Um, hope that you are all staying well and uh, you didn't suffer too much after I took that uh, extended break over the summer. I am back now, back with possibly two videos next week and, and then weekly videos from then on. Um, so stay safe, everybody, and um, I'll see you next time. And yeah. thank you again, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being a part of the summit as well. And for everyone watching too. It's been yeah. fun. This is my first um, live like this. So. Oh, really? Yeah, I should. Cool. I should yeah. Do it right, more often. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Take care, everyone. Bye.